The United Conservatives here in Alberta will be choosing their new leader on October the 6th. Leadership candidates are slowly announcing that they've met the requirements to make it through the race. Travis Taves and Daniel Smith both submitted their paperwork and fees to make it official. Others are close behind. Now to discuss this in more detail is our political reporter and the Alberta correspondent for the National Post, Tyler Dawson, who joins us once again from Edmonton. Tyler, as for the UCP leadership candidates, you say we may see a bit of a thinning of the herd soon, since the actual deadline to enter the race is July 20th? That's right. So you had sort of all these people announce and start their campaigns, but, uh, you know, there is actually sort of an official start, an official time when they need to cough up the money, cough up the signatures, all that kind of stuff to be in. Um, as I think we discussed a little while ago, the, the, the fees are substantial. I think $150,000 or $175,000 to enter and then $25,000 is sort of a, a deposit, a guarantee of good behavior essentially. So these are somewhat high bars to clear and you know it's a, it's a thick herd at the moment, I think about nine people or something like that. Um, so I would expect we see at least a couple people not sort of clear that uh, clear that threshold. Of course they're, they've got staff going around the Calgary Stampede this week trying to get signatures and all that kind of stuff because there's all sorts of specific rules about signatures and, and all those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, we so we should know in the next uh, few days here what the the sort of final slate of contenders is going to look like. What are your thoughts on uh, Ronna Ambrose joining the Rebecca Schultz campaign? I think it's a big boost to Rebecca Schultz's campaign. Um, you know, I think a lot of the attention has been on Brian Jean and Danielle Smith and Travis Taves, and and Re Rebecca Schultz has not got quite as much attention. And and but it's interesting because Ronna Ambrose is one of those names that is always sort of floated as the person who can save the Conservatives, whether that's the federal Conservatives, whether that's the provincial Conservatives. Um, so it's interesting to see her throwing her weight a little bit behind a specific candidate in this race. And that could make some some difference here, I think. Um, but, you know, it, it's still very early days. We don't have tons of polling yet on what's going to happen. So it's hard to sort of predict beyond beyond that. Yeah, I remember interviewing Ron Ambrose on the Hill when she was health minister under the Harper government and very intelligent woman. So she brings a lot of clout to anyone's campaign. Tyler, one of the UCP leadership candidates, Brian Jean, has endorsed the idea of a royalty cut to energy companies. He says this would save Albertans, what, around 15 cents a litre at the pumps? It would. Of course, the question is what it would lose the Treasury in, in money um, and whether or not this is a, you know, a tax cut to corporations, which is what sort of critics have pushed back against this saying, you know, it's it's part of the, you know, we're, we're in the phase, shall we say, of the leadership campaign where we're starting to see some sort of concrete policy announcements. Um, and, and we've seen them from a handful of leaders. And um, so, you know, there's a handful that have been out there and, and we'll be looking for more of those certainly in the days ahead. Some of the UCP leadership candidates have made vaccines and vaccine mandates a major talking point with their platforms. Todd Lowen and Daniel Smith have vowed the lockdowns and mandates will never happen again. But Tyler, let me ask you something. How is that possible if the rules are mandated by Ottawa? Well, that's the thing. You know, some of these rules are federal. Some of them are provincial, of course, and, and the premier would have some say over that. But, you know, this, this, it, what, what, the important thing about this, I think, is not so much the issue of the mandates per se, but more the sort of importance that, that this, the, the pandemic era politics and this sort of schism, this split, um, within the conservative movement in Alberta is still lingering, I think, and is very important to the party. You know, when you have a leader talking about about vaccine mandates and things like that, that is a signal that they believe that that question is really important to the people in the party who are going to be voting on the leadership. Um, so, so it, it's just you know, it's it's a little bit like the Alberta autonomy thing, which which other leaders have been talking about. It just goes to show that this is really important to the people within the party, or at least the people vying for the leadership think it's important to the people in the party. The bigger question, of course, is whether or not these things are important to you know, sort of a broad cross-section of Albertans who um, who are going to be voting for the premier. And the, the other notable thing that, that I'll just mention here is that, you know, this, this the vaccine debate, the autonomy debate is, is happening within the leadership, but there's also the leaders, as I mentioned, who've started, or leadership candidates, who've started coming up with um, sort of concrete policy proposals. There's the one you mentioned from Brian Jean, where John Sani has a whole sort of inflation fighting policy involving de-indexing some of the benefits that are out there and the um, and re-indexing the the tax brackets. And then you also have Danielle Smith coming out with announcing three hundred dollars per Albertan for sort of a health spending account for physio, Cairo, mental health, dental, whatever. Um, so so you you have sort of this one side this maybe we can call it a sort of a culture war kind of 
battle happening, but you also do slowly have some of these policy proposals coming out of the woodwork. Brian Jean has allegedly said, Tyler, that people have actually died from the COVID-19 vaccines. You know, a lot of people, Albertans, have jumped on board and agreed with him. Yeah, and, you know, there's been some relatively recent sort of meta-analysis surveys that suggest that people have died following the vaccine, but there's not very much evidence that people have died because of the vaccine. Um, of course, that's a little bit different from the people who've had really bad side effects. Of course, there was lots of coverage of, I think it was myocarditis, the, the heart sort of disorder that some people had following vaccination. Um, so Inflammation, it, a, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So a, a bit of a strange tack, shall we say, from Brian Jean, and he's come under a lot of criticism um, for, for having said that, you know, the fears that it would scare people away from vaccines and things like that. So so the vaccine thing is it's it's lingering. Um, and I mean, I don't know if I would have predicted that, you know, sort of all the leaders would have thought this was going to be such a big deal, even though in some ways this was the one thing that got Jason Kenney given the boot. You know, it's interesting you talk about the vaccines and talking about vaccine mandates lingering you know, people talking about it, but yet COVID-19 has been lingering as well for a number of years here. And we're talking about 7th and 8th and 9th and 10th, uh, you know, waves. So, yeah, I don't think this is going away anytime soon. Now, while all of this has been going down, Jason Kenney is still plugging away as premier. He was flipping flapjacks at the Calgary Stampede recently, where he announced that September 1st will be our day, Alberta Day. But Tyler, sadly, it won't be a statutory holiday. No. So, you know, a friend asked me earlier, they were like, what are you going to do for Alberta Day? And I said, well, you know, I, th I think I'm going to do what I do every day. I'll, you know, I'll get up and I'll go to work because um, not that much is going to change. Now, there are going to be some announcements down the road on on sort of funding and things like that for community events to, to sort of explore Alberta's history and celebrate Alberta's history. But here, here's the really confusing thing. On August 1st, we have Heritage Day, which is a civic holiday meant to celebrate Alberta's heritage. So, what is the difference here between Alberta's heritage and Alberta's history on the day that we joined Confederation? So a bit of a confusing announcement, I have to say. Um, I, don't get me wrong, I, I love history. I'm all for, for celebrating it. But um, you know, if we're going to have a designated day, why not give us the day off work? Yeah, that's true too. Canada's premiers met in Victoria, B.C. this week, Tyler. Now they're appealing to the federal government for more funding for health care. They are. You know, there was sort of this consensus, I guess, among the premiers that uh, Canada's healthcare system is crumbling and that they need money from the federal government to fix it. Um, and and they've been quite upset that the federal government has not agreed to sort of sit down and discuss the health care transfer situation. Um, you know, a cynic might point out that none of the premiers are talking about raising provincial taxes in order to pay for the health care that they want to have. Um, so it's just notable there that they, they want Justin Trudeau to start cutting even bigger shinier checks for them. Um, but the other thing I would just note that we kind of hinted at, Jason Kenney's still out working. You know, he, he's, he's resigned. He, his, his time as premier is going to be coming to an end in the next couple months. Um, but, you know, he, he hasn't given his two-week notice and then it spent the whole time out on a cigarette break. You know, he's still, he's still getting around and making announcements and doing things, which, uh, you know, think what one may of Jason Kenney, but uh, he does seem to still be putting in the mileage. As the war between Ukraine and Russia continues, Tyler, more than 3,800 Ukrainians have arrived here in our province in Alberta, mostly women and children. Now, the province announced more funding for those arriving, including, what, six months of temporary income assistance for those arriving after July 25th? The, the Alberta government has been very um, bullish, shall, shall we say, on and supporting people from Ukraine who've arrived here, of course, because there's 350-odd thousand, I think, Ukrainians in Alberta, so quite a large diaspora population. Um, and this is just sort of the latest in a, in a series of, of um, announcements the government has made. I, I think they've spent about $15 million to date on supports for people coming from Ukraine. They're, they're working to process um, some, some sort of work visas and things like that more quickly, that sort of thing. But this new announcement, as you say, is sort of temporary income assistance for food, clothing, shelter, you know, all the things that a person needs when they arrive on our shores, so to speak. And that'll cost between 15 million and I think 38 million was sort of the upper end. And, you know, the reason for that enormous range is it really just depends how many people come. Um, obviously, the, the, the chunk of money is going to uh, increase if there's more people here. So just, a, you know, another thing that the Alberta government is uh, is doing on that front, as as frankly, that uh, the story, the war in Ukraine seems to be largely fading in a lot of ways from from headlines, unfortunately. The party which calls itself the government in waiting, the opposition NDP, say they really have a plan to fight inflation and to help farmers here in Alberta. Tell me more about some of the proposals from Rachel Notley and her team. 
Right. So if people cast their minds back a couple of years, three years, I guess, one of the things the United Conservatives did really, really well during the Rachel Notley years was they had policy proposals, they had policy papers, they said, this is what we would do. They called on the NDP to do X, Y, Z. They really, really set them up themselves up as the next government. Um, and, and the strategy worked for them, I think, in a lot of ways. And the NDP is, you know, doing that too. And so on the on the inflation question, you know, the big thing that they propose is re-indexing and de-indexing. So if people remember, some of the benefits that are paid out by the Alberta government, mainly AISH payments, um, which are payments to those with disabilities, were de-indexed, meaning they did not go up with inflation annually. Um, and at the same time, the tax brackets were uh, also de-indexed. And so that meant that your tax bracket did not creep upwards um, each year, meaning that the exemption amount at the bottom end, the $19,000 or so, um, would stay the same and has been the same for the last few years. So basically, this is a roundabout way of me getting to the, the NDP is saying that they are going to re-index both of these things to increase payments to people who are on government support and re-index um, the tax brackets so that you get more money exempted basically at tax season. So that's their, their big uh, proposal for inflation. On the farming front, there's a handful of things. And, and the ones that really jumped out at me were ways to sort of lower capital costs for loans and things like that to small businesses and agricultural operators. And, and the other one that jumped out, which is something that the UCP has talked about, the federal liberals, the federal conservatives, everyone's talked about it. But um, it is also to improve connectivity, internet connectivity in rural areas because of the importance, certainly in this new, new, new normal, whatever new normal we're on now, um, you know, working from home and things like that, the internet has never been more important for people. Yeah, farmers, producers need access to the digital mm -hmm. age as well. They have to get online, absolutely. And the faster and the sooner the better. Tyler, the UCP has extended its utility rebate for six months, which will be around $300. But there is a catch. What is that catch? Yeah, the catch is that if you live in a place where everything is sort of sub-metered is the term, you might not get the money. So if you live in a house, your power is coming to your power box thing and and you're going to get the rebate. If you live in an apartment building or a condo board where there's sort of one meter and it's sort of defrayed across all these people, you, you may not get this payment. So my colleagues at the Edmonton Journal have been reporting on this, and, and it basically looks like a, a good chunk of the population will not actually get this rebate. Um, and, and critics have pointed out that you know, the people most likely to need the rebate, you know, those in rental housing and things like that, um, might not be the ones who get it. So uh, as far as I've seen, there hasn't been any major movement on changing that. Logistically, one has to wonder if they even could change something like that. Um, but uh, certainly a little bit of a twist in an announcement that I think everyone was quite happy to hear about. Something else we should probably talk about as well as how the Kenny government has given us that break at the, at the pumps, 13 cents, you know, eliminating the provincial tax for now. And there's been a talk of an extension for that as well. There has. And, you know, I look at the pumps, when I, the price when I drive by, and I can't imagine paying what it would have been um, if they didn't have that. So, yeah, but 13 cents, I think. And there does seem to be a little bit of a disconnect between, you know, prices coming down with the market and things like that. So hopefully, as far as I've been told and as far as what I've seen from analysts, um, we should actually see prices start to go down in the next week or two uh, for a variety of reasons, but um, a, li a little more of a break for folks uh, in the next little while. And that, and that one's uh, maybe thanks strictly to market forces. And Kenny, what did he say as long as it's uh, 90 above 80 or $90 US a barrel? Yeah, eighty dollars a barrel, I believe, and it's sort of a sliding scale. Um, so it's the it's the full amount when it's over ninety or a hundred dollars a barrel, and then will be X cents if it drops and things like that. So the amount might shift a little bit, but there should be a fuel tax cut for I, I would imagine the foreseeable future. He's our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent for the National Post, Tyler Dawson. Tyler, thanks so much for joining us today from Edmonton. Always a pleasure, Hal.